You've had quite a morning already since you've been here. Well, I'll tell you, <laughs> one of the best parts of this, this radio station gig is the stuff that happens off the air, and today was particularly entertaining. I would say. And I was, I was brutalized by, <laughs> well, by, by my co-host. <laughs> yeah. but, but, but that's you, okay, you, and we can't talk about it on the air. <laughs> no, well, I am about to. Yeah, I'm about to. You don't no, know no, what, no. what a psychological impact had on me. You're talking about making these little girls cry <laughs> and then basically kicking them as to get out of your way. That's, that's a serious accusation. Uh, yeah. here. <laughs> I, I, I'm not running for anything, but I, but I do have to defend against that. No, that's not the discussion. Was, not totally true, but it was, slightly. It was about, I was, I was district champion debater when I was in high school, and it happened to be one where I, I pushed a young lady a little hard during cross-examination, and she started to cry, and I kind of doubled down on that. And, and I paid the price by getting lowest speaker points. And she actually got highest speaker points, and I shared that I found a new strategy that I just wasn't very good at. So, so from that point on, in every debate, John would start crying at the right yeah. time. If, if and, Craig doesn't like one of his questions, don't be surprised if John just breaks down and starts crying. He knows that technique works. No, no, I thought I could cry. <laughs> if my points go up, I should cry. Exactly. Let's welcome in Senate President Craig Blair. Good morning, sir. How are you? Good morning. Great to have you with us. It's a pleasure to be here. Do you feel particularly vulnerable or emotional at this time? It's starting to. Would <laughs> <laughs> you like a tissue? <laughs> just uh, in case. Well, just let them run down my face. You're on camera here now. <laughs> uh, uh, Craig, let's talk about those October numbers. As there was a, uh, a, a slight surplus uh, in the revenues. Yeah, for October, we exceeded estimates by about $7.5 million. And so... Uh, instead of the quarter, we're one-third of the way through the fiscal year, and we're above revenue estimates for $242 million. Personal income tax is actually very strong. Uh, we exceeded revenue estimates for the month by almost $10 million. But uh, for the year, it's 121 of that 242. Severance tax collections. And I'm here to announce uh, that we're off the severance tax roller coaster. Uh, I'm, I've been doing this for a long time and in the state of West Virginia. They kept the severance tax numbers up uh, in the revenue estimates all the time. And the thing about it is, is that it's feast or famine. Sometimes the cost of energy is really high, sometimes it's low. And so the severance tax numbers would always be on this roller coaster. We're keeping them down on the low side now. And if they come in above, then that allows us to have re revenues so to speak to be able to, to to do infrastructure well right now for this year we're 53 million dollars under uh 40 of it was this last month month of uh, on this and i think that that's got uh, some to do with reporting also craig before but, uh, on severance tax how what percent comes to the state and the counties get a, si a sizable percent to the not do it, do it it all depends on which severance tax it is and then which county it is yes. like mm -hmm. if you're a coal producing county you're going to get more than what you are if you're berkeley county yeah i understand uh, for that but, but for the state i'm talking about the state what percent does the state get do you right, know? It's, it's probably 75 plus percent oh is that right yeah okay. it, it's, it's it, there's a good bit involved in that yeah, okay. then there's tax of rebates or, or credits that can actually come out of the severance tax that goes back also. Uh, and so that's why you see sometimes the severance tax where there'll be additional money come in, we're still under the revenue estimates mm -hmm. of because of how that's manipulated around. Okay. Uh, that has not been smoothed out, but what it is is that we're estimating it low and managing it that way. Sales tax, uh, we missed the revenue estimates of this last month by three hundred and eleven thousand dollars not millions i wanted to say millions before the year they were of 12 million above now here's the one that's really interesting and that is we were 15 million over our revenue estimates on the corporate net of and that's the income tax that gets charged to businesses of on the profits that they make and so to, for the year so far it's 86 million and we've lowered that down and that happened even before the republicans took over we started lowering the corporate net down but it goes to show that if you lower the tax 
and then you have more activity for whatever it is that you're doing. And that and that's what we want in this state, more job opportunities, more business. Uh, and you can see that happening, and that's happening throughout the state of West Virginia. So we're looking good from that standpoint. We're still, for the rainy day fund, current balance on it is $1.17 billion of on that and so the, to, to, I'm going to break down these uh, real quick too compared to our general revenue expenditures it's 24 uh, percent that's 88 days worth of that the rainy day fund is uh, 36th in the nation but we're ninth when it comes to expenditures uh, for for rainy day funds so they, those are excellent numbers in the scheme of things our pensions are in good shape and what's this do when i talk about this it makes it so that we're more attractive to industry we're more attractive to retaining our jobs growing the jobs that we currently have in this state all these things come into play for that you said 36th and rainy day funds is that as a gross amount or as a percentage that's that's the gross amount okay what do you mean by being ninth in the nation for expenditure? Then you match that up to what your general revenue is, and yeah. it's compared to your general revenue. And to, so we can't – California has – 40 million people. A, a thousand times the size of budget yeah. is what yeah. we do. And so their rainy day fund could be small in comparison of their general revenue budget but still be larger than our $1.2 sure. okay. billion. Yeah. Right. Yeah, I'm uh, I'm fascinated or intrigued or impressed is probably a better word that uh, with a personal income tax, even though you gave a 21 percent uh, tax rebate, uh, you're still up by 10 million dollars. Uh, is that because of the new businesses that we've come into this state or our increased salaries or what? It's a combination of a multitude mm -hmm. of things. Uh, wage inflation has a bearing on that. Uh, we can see that no matter where. Oh, and by the way, there's less than 9,000 people drawing unemployment in the state right now. That's a big deal. In the whole too, state? Ladies, in, in the whole state. And when you're talking about 1.8 million people, that's those are good numbers uh, for, from that standpoint. Uh, but then it's not just the wage inflation uh, that has a bearing on that, too. It's uh, when you lower the tax, just like I was saying on the corporate net, it makes it so that you can generate more revenues and there's more people working now there's going to be more people coming off the medicaid rolls too west virginia is improving our economy is improving the status of our people are improving so that means that uh the amount of money that you get from the federal government will be reduced that goes into the medicaid fund and so when that happens then there'll be more people that are actually be coming off of where they're getting some sort of an entitlement check or assistance, however you want to look at that, and they'll be coming out and moving into the workforce. And we're preparing for that too, for with job trainings, with job opportunities, uh, to be able to take care of that. And there's shortages of for everything from Dairy Queen to talk show host to, to the, the list goes on. I just shouldn't played the talk show host. But no matter where you go in industry, mm -hmm. there there are people, they're, they're hiring. They're hiring, they're hiring. Now, mm -hmm. but i got to add one more thing. Mm -hmm. The jobs that we've created, some of them are here and have already kicked in, but a lot of the big, big ones, and there's getting ready to be another big one getting to be announced. Uh, they're not here yet. Those are construction yeah, jobs. Sure. Uh, but when you look at Roads to Prosperity, uh, we're still working on the roads in the state of West Virginia because you can't do them all at one time. Uh, and But we're, we're getting there, and that helps keep things up as well. There was concern a couple or so years or so ago that when COVID funds started drying up, that the that the state had become so accustomed and so using the COVID funds so many different ways that we would suffer economy-wise. My sense, that did not happen at all. We have not felt the loss of COVID funds. We were very, very careful, whether it be the governor or the legislature, on how we managed the COVID funds and utilized them in such a way not to be able to become intoxicated on, on those funds. And so what we did most of the time is used them for one-time expenditures, capital improvements, stuff like that. But we never allowed that to affect our mindset. Now, we, of course, there was people, the liberals, 
Falls, especially out here. And what I'm talking about is the West Virginia Center for Budget and Policy, which is a joke. You shouldn't pay any attention to them at all. <laughs> They're nothing but a liberal think tank. Uh, the fact is, is that they were ho- hollering for that. And to, the last thing I want to <clears> do is to go back to where we were uh, just a short less than a decade ago and then you go back in time to when I was a kid how the funds were utilized in this state was wrong and how how we're getting them right now for the people and they're benefiting from it and so I did it's one of the most passionate parts of my job and I'm good with numbers I'm not good with words I'm good with numbers being able to understand how to make the economics work whether it's a small business or whether it's the state of West Virginia it's working, and I'm proud of it. I want to shift gears to the election that's that's coming up. You've been doing this for a long time, and you've risen to the position of president of the Senate, which is functionally the lieutenant governor of the state. Um, here in the Eastern Panhandle, we have a number of leadership positions in the House and Senate that are all clustered around here. Why is that important to to the Eastern Panhandle, the fact that, that a local – a, a local senator is, in fact, the president of the Senate. Well, well first of all, the influence of, but also that, look, there's been a long history of whoever's been in charge. It's about how much money they can drag back to their area. Mm-hmm. Okay? And, and yes, there are the, the fair proportionate number from me being Senate president and, and our team that we have that works together up here, we bring dollars back to the Eastern Panhandle. The difference is is that we don't go out here and get our pictures taken and, and brag about it and all that. What we're trying to do is make it so that you can actually keep more of your tax dollars without the state taking them away. That is an Eastern Panhandle position and that a lot of us were talking that before it was talked about by anybody else. And then what you do is you lift up the rest of the state, and you have to, to – anybody that doesn't believe me, you need to go to the southern part of the state. There are areas that are third world, and we need to be able to lift those areas up, give them jobs, give them opportunity, give them hope, give them an education. The list goes on. And by the way, they actually helped us out in the years past when coal was king, and that, that was the industry for there, and we were agrarian here in the Eastern Panhandle. So they lifted us up. So that's what we're really trying to do, is making it, to Walter Duke, Delegate Duke, good friend of mine, used to say, rising tide lifts all boats. He's absolutely right on that. And so what we want to do is to be able to invest, reinvest in ourselves in the, in the rest of West Virginia. And what is good for West Virginia is great for the Eastern Panhandle. We benefit from that. So I don't know whether I answered your question, but I can tell you that's what motivates. Okay, and and but I want to get to that because isn't isn't there a lot of pushback? Do the, do the folks in the the poorer sections of the state understand that rising tide lifts all boats? It seems to me there is some competition or some bitterness between parts of the state and the eastern panhandle. That that uh, there has been in the past, but there's less of it. Now, especially because of me, of uh, look, Senate presidents used to come in, and uh, what they would do is say, "This is what our agenda is. This is what we're going to do," and then he could convince everybody to vote along with him, one way or another, on there. And that has changed significantly under my leadership. And what it is is, I facilitate the will of the caucus. I do not dictate it. Okay, and that's important. And we gather, I have a workbook, and in the beginning of December, I'll have all the members together in a room, and we will go for hours and hours over the workbook on all the agenda items that we want to do for the upcoming session. And then when the session begins, I'm notorious for launching all the bills that didn't get done the previous year and launching those out on the very first day. This year, there's over 70 of them. So it's probably going to take a three-day process to be able to do that. But what it is is that you shouldn't dictate to your members because that does not make good government. What you do is facilitate the will of the membership, and when you do that, then there's the benefit that comes from that. There's a trust. There is the ability to be able to get greater things done because of the team effect. Politics, 
is not a one-man sport. Lots of people believe that, but that is not the case at all. If you can't garner the votes to get something done, then you are worthless and you should stay home. I can very much so, I've done a great job of being able to garner the votes to get many things done over the years. And most of the time, it's by listening, not telling. Craig, uh, Cindy Barnhart Galt, who is, uh, according to her Facebook post, is from Hedgesville High. She says, you keep growing Berkeley County, but not helping the school system. The employees are overwhelmed covering for the shortages. Okay. And so, once again, Amendment 4 failed, and that, that, that would have actually put a little bit of a control on that. We're, we're going to use an example. And I've been working with uh, Jackie Long and the State Board of Education and of uh, Eric Keysucker for another one uh, who's head of the bus department. I'm using the bus scenario because that's the one that we've got right now. And we have put, been putting resources in, into the education system. By the way, pay raise after pay raise after pay raise uh, for them. And so we're, we're, it's the thing about it is, is that I didn't stay on topic. Forgive me. Let's go back to the bus. There's eight pages, eight pages of requirements to be a bus driver of all these different criteria and we're going through right now and determining whether that is necessary whether it can be waived whether it needs to be waived short term what it takes to be able to get the kids into the classroom and i've got one lady of i think she's in back creek valley that the bus has been canceled that route has been canceled 10 times so far this year and we're only what on our second month, starting our third month of the school year. That can't happen. And But it, then it takes months to become a school bus driver. So, there are, yes, there are problems. But we wanted to get to the core of it, and Amendment 4 would allow that to happen. And it passed in Berkeley County. God bless the people of Berkeley County. They got what was going on. Uh, but you can't have an unelected body creating law and then creating a bureaucracy and then never going back and looking at the bureaucracy. That same teacher got an email just recently in the last two weeks that asked questions, and it came from the speaker and myself. It's the first time that I know of this ever happening because we're working with the State Department of Education to be able to get back feedback directly from the teachers to understand what they're going through. Discipline in the classroom is a problem. Uh, and how can you teach whenever the, the, you have no control over the classroom and the teachers are not afforded that ability? And then, do you, do, and I'm going to go a little bit off the rail here on this one, but you know what? It all correlates with when we took the Ten Commandments out of the classroom. If you do not, if you're blind to that, and have not seen the progression to that, then I, I, don't, I don't know what to tell you. We need to figure out how to be able to get discipline back in the classroom, get the kids in the seat, and all, by the way, and then the absenteeism rate is just as high for teachers as what it is the students in some areas of the state. So we've got, there's a, there's a lot of work that needs to be done, but we've done alternative education. The, your charter schools, home schools, micro schools, the Hope Scholarship, all that's done. That creates a competitive environment for public education. And then for the first time in over 50 years in the Senate, you have a true educator, a true teacher as the chairman of the Senate Education Committee. I'm putting the Amy resources. Grady. Yes. Amy Grady. Putting the resources in place right now to take those deep dives into public education. But remember that the legislature can only do so much because not at this point in time, but in the past, the West Virginia State Department of Education has felt that they're a fourth branch of government and they only need to do what they want to do. And they're an unelected body. I don't want to be beating on them right now because they are 
working well. But people come and go. The tide comes in and out. That's where Amendment 4 would have made all the difference. By the way, Great. we're going to do a full hour on education tomorrow yeah. with Delegate Mike Hornby, who's on the Education Committee in the House, Bill. Yeah. Uh, Craig, I wish we had a couple of hours talking about all these subjects, but yes. we don't, unfortunately. Uh, but I want to pick up on something that I, I thought that John Gilscrap was going down the path a couple minutes ago, and that's the upcoming election. Uh, I know you're being challenged. Uh, we have been, uh, in the Eastern Panhandle, have been very fortunate. In fact, we've become kind of accustomed to the leadership that in the legislature that the Eastern Panhandle has provided. But that's going to change with Charlie Trump stepping down, with uh, Eric Householder stepping down, John Hardy stepping down, all running for different jobs. So that, in my mind, puts even more of a consideration of the leadership that we have now and to the advantage that we have. So that would, I would think that would play to your advantage in your reelection. I guess so. Uh, I did, that's hard for me to respond to you laid it out Charlie Trump leaving will yeah. be a loss yep. but it's also a gain there is no question in my mind that he is not going to be in the next Supreme Court we hope so in, we hope in so. the state of West yeah. Virginia and that is advantageous to every West Virginia yeah. not just the people in the 15th senatorial district uh, the, you, people come and go I, and I, I see that institutional knowledge means a lot knowing how to get things done knowing how the process works knowing the rules of the game knowing Knowing the people, of and then knowing what needs to be done, and then garnering those votes. That is one of the advantages I've had. I've been in the minority when I was in the House of Delegates for all four terms on that, and then for the Senate for the first of two years of me being in the Senate, I was in the minority. And then I'm in the majority. I've seen, I'm a study of human nature and why humans behave the way they do. And, and so this is advantageous. It's made it so that you, you can get things done. I never wanted to be the Senate president. Of I would Bill Cole, good man, great man for that matter. Mitch Carmichael, very much so the same on that. They're good leaders. They did different things and got great things done. I was behind the scenes trying to help them, make them be successful. Our morning meetings at 7 o'clock started one week after the Republicans took over, and it was me stomping over to Bill's office saying, I can't take it any longer. Nobody knows what's going on. And we hadn't been in charge for over 80 years. And so, but we started our morning meetings, things start smoothing out. And those morning meetings that everybody thinks that legislators are out having just a great time. No, they're at work on the Senate side at seven o'clock in the morning, every day of the week. What well, I'd say that Monday through Friday when we're there. And then if we're working for the weekend, then we're there in the morning also. Uh, but you know, there, there is an advantage. I am the first Senate president, Lieutenant governor, from the Eastern Panhandle in the history of the state. And it's paying dividends for the Eastern Panhandle. The, my biggest problem is, is that I like moving on. I'm a fixer. I like moving on to the next thing to get done. And I don't spend much time taking credit for what has happened in the past. And we had a conversation earlier, and you were, talk, you were talking about the campaign, and I said, I, I, it's not important what you've done it's important when, it, when it comes to elections. It's what you want to do. It's what you want to do for into the future. That's how you, what you should be electing people on. And I've got plenty of ideas on what still needs to be done. Well, that's, that's important. I yield to that. But I also will not discount the fact we look back upon what has been done. And I think you have, you have a highly credible uh, performance of what has been done. A track record of yeah. success is yeah. a component uh, of what goes on yeah. because you can talk all day long about what you want to do. Yeah. And you've got a history yeah. of not getting anything yeah. done. It's yeah. nothing but words. Any words on Route 9 and its future, Craig? Uh, but there is work that, that is being uh, done on Route 9. I don't want to talk about that at this point in time. And the reason for it is is that I don't want to put false hope out there. Uh, but there, there's going, there's going to be some work that gets done on Route Nine. All right, we are just about out of time. Final thought is yours. Oh, I don't know. I hadn't given that <laughs> thought. Let's go back and talk about Channel Ten, uh, for a minute, and how you're on the air with this. 
I, I hate to tell you this, but I don't watch a lot of TV, and when I do, it's streaming. Of and I watched the ball game the other night in Channel Ten. Of the, the, at, I'll have to give kudos of to, to, to WRNR and what you're doing out here, and for that. And I, I bought some advertising for that. And I already had somebody tell me. I seen you on the ball game the other night, and, and I'm like, am I that far out of the loop uh, that I did not see that how many people are are watching uh, the, the channel ten that's out there? So I figure I put that plug in there for everybody to be able to do that because I enjoyed the game. Uh, cool. So, well, uh, a uh, testament to uh, the guy that owns the place, Mike Cornby. It was his vision. This is, was something that did not exist before he bought the place. We had a, a very poor audio signal that used to go out on Channel 10, and it was uh, his vision to uh, first fix the audio signal and then second to add television to it. Yeah, and, and, and now let me close. And that is Mike, Delegate Mike Hornby has applied those same, that same logic of thinking and, mm -hmm. and how to improve to being a legislator. And those are exactly the people that we need in the legislature in the state of West Virginia. Somebody that knows how to make a payroll and get the job done and have vision for a future. Mike is really good at that. I mm -hmm. have to give him a lot of credit for it. He's a great guy, too. Yeah. Yeah. Hey, Craig, thanks for coming by. Thank you.